Hello, my name is Ben Hublin, and I'm a commissioner with the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. As the Federal Clearinghouse on Election Administration, the EAC is working to provide information and resources for election officials and offering whatever support we can at the federal level to help state and local officials administer safe, secure, accessible, and accurate elections. With election officials facing an array of challenges around the country, we've been working to identify and share solutions that have helped some states. Today's video chat is focused on the role of professional staff supporting state election official associations. In this video, we'll hear from Matt Crane, Aaron Ackerman, and Katherine Harper, all of whom serve as executive directors for state election official associations. First, I'll be joined by Matt Crane and Aaron Ackerman. Uh, welcome. Uh, Matt Crane has worked in election administration in Colorado for over 22 years at both the state and local levels, including serving five years as the elected clerk and recorder of Arapahoe County. Matt currently serves as the executive director of the Colorado County Clerks Association, and he also serves as an election security expert consultant supporting CISA's election security and resilience team. And then Aaron Ackerman uh, is the president of Ackerman Consulting, a full service government relations and political affairs firm. In that role, he's represented nonprofit organizations, statewide associations, Fortune 500 companies, state colleges, and local governments. Notably for this conversation, he also serves as the executive director of the Ohio Association of Election Officials. Thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, and just to, start, <laughs> uh, just to start off, I uh, would love to, love to hear from each of you a little bit more about how election administration is structured in your state, uh, who runs elections at the local level, uh, and if they have other responsibilities, and if so, if you can share some of those examples. Uh, Matt, you've done that role, so we'll start with you. You get the honor. Sure. First of all, Commissioner, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to join the conversation today. I appreciate it. In Colorado, our model at the at the state level, um, the Secretary of State has oversight um, at the state level, but where the elections are really run is at the local level, as, as we all know, and that's uh, here in Colorado, that structure is the county clerk and recorder who is in charge of running elections. We have 64 counties here in Colorado. Uh, um, we have 63 of our county clerks are elected. We have one up in Broomfield County that's appointed, but um, so but so every four years uh, we just went through a cycle where the vast majority of our of our clerks were on the ballot. In terms of things uh, that they're also responsible for, I you know when I when I was a clerk I looked around and it's kind of a hodgepodge mishmash of things. It's like when they were creating county government, there was a clear role for sheriffs, a clear role for coroner, um, and then everything else that didn't fit in there or the assessor's office got dumped into the clerk and recorder's office. So. And we're in charge of running elections. Um, we're in charge. We serve as the uh, registered agents for the state in terms of uh, driver's license uh, and, and motor vehicles, license plates. We also have recording that we do. So recording of uh, license, uh, license plates, marriage licenses, uh, real estate deeds, those types of things. In some parts of Colorado, they're in charge of liquor licensing. You know, it wouldn't be Colorado if we didn't have some marijuana licensing in some of our, some of our offices. So there's a lot that there's a lot that our folks are responsible for. And it's one of the things that we've really been trying to push out. You know, people think that our elections are our job 24 7 365. And there's so much more uh, that that our clerks and their staffs are responsible for. Thank you for that. That's a it's a tough one to follow. And Aaron, I think you've got a little bit a little bit easier story there in Ohio. That's yeah, no, no marijuana licensing at the Board of Elections <laughs> in Ohio. Um, similar to Colorado, we have a Secretary of State that is the Chief Elections Officer for the state, uh, but also, as Matt indicated, the real day-to-day -day work um, of administering elections occurs at the county level. We have uh, 88 counties. Each of those has a county board of elections that is appointed by the Secretary of State, kind of with the advice and consent of the local political parties from each of those counties. And it's comprised of two Republicans and two Democrats. Uh, and then that board of elections hires professional staff to administer elections day in and day out and kind of run the office. So we'll have a director, a deputy director, and then depending on the size of the county, uh, we'll have additional clerks that that help um, fill the various roles. Um, but we are only responsible for elections uh, at the local level. We don't have any other uh, job duties or responsibilities. 
Thanks for that. Uh, and Aaron, we'll stick with you on this next one. Uh, you can go first on this one. Uh, I, I was interested to hear a little bit from both of you about uh, the history of why your state association decided uh, to professionalize the role uh, that you currently hold. Uh, Aaron, I, I know that you were, uh, you know, representing Ohio election officials uh, before you transitioned over to this role. Uh, but can you talk about talk about that and that history a little bit? Sure. Uh, up until 2001, the Ohio Secretary of State's office actually was responsible for all the advocacy work for the local Board of Elections Association. And really prior to the Help America Vote Act in Florida in 20, uh, 2000, it, it, that worked um, and everyone pretty much got along. Elections were pretty straightforward at that point um, and simple. And then as they got more complex, uh, we started to notice that there were schisms on policy areas, key policy areas um, between the state level elections directors and the local elections directors. Um, and so actually the Secretary of State at the time recommended to my association that they consider hiring an outside uh, legislative agent to do the lobbying and, ad and advocacy work. So in 2001, um, I was fortunate enough to be selected to lobby for OAEO, the Ohio Association of Election Officials. Uh, and I did that job for about 10 years. Um, through, over the course of those 10 years, I got more involved with the association. I started to help with some conference planning, running committees, uh, doing the day-to-day -day kind of work that it takes to just kind of keep an association going. So in 2011, they asked me if I would consider um, adding the title of uh, executive director along with a lobbyist. Um, so I was glad again to do that. Um, so since 2011, that's been my role. Um, I guess it looks a little bit better in the papers when you're quoted as the executive director as opposed to maybe the lobbyist. Um, maybe it adds a little bit of gravitas to your quotes. I'm not sure. Uh, but but I do continue to serve as the, the primary advocate for my organization. And then I also have those uh, executive director responsibilities as well. Thank you. And, and Matt, uh, again, uh, you've had uh, a few roles there in Colorado, so I hope that you could share some similar insight uh, in into this to the change in Colorado or the development there. Sure, I think um, so. The the clerks, the Colorado County Clerks Association, has actually been around for over fifty years. Um, the role of executive director, though, is relatively new. And I think, as Aaron said, you know, once Florida happened and Hava kicked into gear, and we saw a lot more focus on the professionalization. Um, of this of this career field, which it, it's as we all know, it absolutely is a career field. Um, and so as we as we talked about in the opening question, there is so much that's on the plate of, of clerk and recorders all across Colorado that it just became overwhelming. We have an executive board of, of clerk and recorders um, and they did the work for years, um, but it just became overwhelming when we're talking about conference planning, when we're talking about taking the lead at the legislature. There's so much on this uh, on what on the on the association now that around two, I believe 2010 or 11 was when we first hired um, an executive director. Our first one was Danetta Davidson, who um, I think most everybody knows, uh, former Colorado Secretary of State, kind of clerk here, former EAC commissioner. Um, and so she was, there was nobody better to start off uh, in that position to help starting to professionalize the role, the association, so on and so forth. Um, and then when Donetta decided that uh, she wanted to retire, Pam Anderson, um, who's very well known in the election community, one of the best in the country, um, stepped into the role and she decided in um, uh, 2020 um, that she uh, was ready for some new challenges and then that's when I got hired uh, in January of 2021 so it's still relatively new about a decade for us maybe a little bit more um, but as the as you know as the jobs have become more complicated the, the you know having this assistance has been a big help I, I can say that firsthand as a clerk being able to rely on Donetta and Pam was was a huge benefit to me yeah, and that's, you know, I, I really, that was an area I'd love to hear more about, Matt, uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, both both in the role now, uh, you know, your experience before, can you talk a little bit about sort of from both perspectives, you know, I guess, I guess how when you were a clerk, uh, having folks in that role uh, helped you, and then now that you're in that role, how you think of it in order to help your clerks around the state? Sure, it's it, it has been a tremendous help for in a number of different ways. One, having somebody like Danetta who has seen and done everything, she'll she's forgotten more about elections than I'll ever know. 
Um, and then having Pam, who is has is a, a tremendous friend, but a fantastic mentor as well. So having somebody in that role that one can be a mentor and you can bounce things off of is a tremendous is a tremendous help. Having somebody that you know uh, can be at the legislature and represent the interests of clerks across any of our uh, of the things that we're responsible for is a big help as well. And so, you know, and then if there's something that comes up, they did a great job of saying, okay, Matt, we need you to show up and testify on this today. And, you know, Carly and Weld, we need you here on this day. They do a really great job of making sure that we're aware of things at the legislature um, so that we can focus on ultimately what the voters elected us to do, which is run the office in our counties and provide the best customer service across everything we do for the citizens who elected us. And so having somebody in that role to be able to really focus on that and allow us to do that and yet still keep an eye on the broader landscape for us um, was a tremendous help. Also in terms of conferences, making sure that we have great conferences with amazing content where we can not only get together and talk about best practices in the state, but have representatives from the EAC come out or from CISA come out or other people doing amazing work in other states, bringing them to Colorado so that uh, we can all share best practices and hear from other people, you know, was a tremendous help. I think what's interesting about when I came in, um, much like when I started in elections in 2000, right, they came in during the middle of Florida, which is, holy moly, I mean, what an amazing time to start. And then 2020, I start this new job, or 2021, right in the aftermath of the of the 2020 presidential, and we see all the MDM and everything that's come about since then. Um, we we focused a lot more at that point in time, because again, everybody's so focused on their jobs, but now they have to deal with uh, bad actors and MDM people coming in and, and you know, demanding at their counters, right? Especially in medium and small size counties where the clerk will be actually on the counter issuing a license plate as well as running the election, everything else. And now they have citizens coming in and they hear something on um, some crazy website that says, oh, your systems were hacked and they're demanding to know. Um, so really the focus uh, for me over the last couple of years was um, trying to make sure that we're staying on top of all of the latest rumors and doing, and we've seen this, um, Commissioner, I know you guys have focused on it and, and you know, my colleagues at CISA, we focused on that too, is kind of rumor versus reality, rumor control. So it was pulling together as much information as I can um getting going through the weeds of all of it and then getting information out to my folks about okay here's what's true here's what's not true here's what somebody may say about georgia or arizona or pennsylvania so that they have the ammunition because they don't have time to go and do the research so putting information in front of them that they can consume easily and then be able to go out and communicate effectively in their communities um so and then you know we had the whole tina peters thing which added a layer of complexity here for us um, so being able to help make sure that everybody's informed and have constant communication with them, I think, um, was a big, um, you know, was a big success for the association over the last couple of years. And I know our members have been grateful for that. That's great. I know, I know, you know, sort of watching or observing from a distance, uh, one of the things that really, you know, that that piece sort of stands out to me that's that that extra set of hands that, that doesn't have sort of the day-to-day -day of everything else. I mean, you know, again, particularly, uh, you know, thinking about some of the the list of responsibilities that that you ran through in Colorado, uh, you know, it's obviously more than a full-time job. And, and if you're piling on sort of responsibilities with your state association, I know, uh, you know, in the states that that is, is volunteer-driven, you know, often, you know, that gets back burnered. I, I certainly, uh, you know, I certainly understand that, you know, you get on these subcommittees and, and you've got, you know, you've got the day job that comes up and, and you know, certainly, certainly when somebody's standing there at the counter, like that, that's who gets served first. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that's an important thing to consider uh, when we look at, at sort of the dynamics and this changing environment and all of the challenges uh, you know, to have somebody who's there, uh, you know, able to keep track of that and, and doesn't have to to do some of, um, you know, some of the day job that, uh, that the officials have to do. Um, and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned in there, a big piece of this uh, is also thinking about working uh, with the state legislature, uh, you know, uh, and certainly uh, that is, is uh, I know, a notable part of these roles is, is monitoring and engaging on legislation. Of course, uh, the EAC does not advocate for legislation, but we certainly know the difference that it can make 
uh, to provide policymakers with technical assistance to help uh, avoid unintended consequences or, or undesired outcomes. Uh, Aaron, you mentioned uh, how you came into the job and that uh, you know that transition. Uh, obviously, very familiar uh, with with state legislatures. Uh, can you talk about how this role helps to coordinate uh, your election officials in Ohio uh, and their interaction or work with the legislature? Sure. Um, well, we do have a legislative committee that's very, very active. They review every piece of election legislation that comes out. Our board of trustees kind of goes through everything and determines whether or not we want to take a position on a piece of legislation. But uh, as you mentioned, one of the primary roles really is just to educate the legislature about how local elections work and trying to help them avoid those unintended consequences. Even the most well-intentioned law can end up going awry if it's not written correctly. And so we we pay close attention to those kinds of things. But just kind of echo what's been said, you know, the the boards of elections are uh, busy, busy people. They can't sit at the state house 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which it seems like we're dealing with the legislative elections legislation that that frequently and that often these days. Um, and I can. So that's what I'm paid to do is to sit at the state house sometimes and take uh, copious notes and let the let the folks know what's going on um, down in the halls of the state house and then do our best to synthesize that. Um, so I do kind of serve as the primary advocate. I mean, I'm there um, a lot. Uh, and so I often get cornered by legislators and ask questions about election administration. And um, to the extent I know the answer, I'll provide it. And if I don't, I certainly commit to getting back to those policymakers quickly. So yeah, I mean, I think the association plays a key role um, in trying to do that. The other thing I would note that I think is interesting is we do have a 100% bipartisan association. Uh, and most people, uh, when they're passing election laws, do want there to be some semblance of bipartisanship involved in that. Um, and so we kind of hold it out there as a, as a trophy to earn our endorsement um, for legislation. And we want to be the people that can go in and say, this is a good uh, politically neutral bill that's not favoring Republicans or Democrats, but is you know going to help voters and going to help election administrators. Um, so we do work very hard on a bipartisan basis uh, to work with our legislators to say, hey, if, if you want us to endorse this bill, uh, here, here are the things that we think it should uh, contain. Uh, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But I do think that most legislators really do reach out earnestly uh, and want to earn our support and want to work with us to get it right. Um, and I think that you know, we've we've run pretty good elections in Ohio for a long period of time, and I do chalk that up to us working very successfully with our state legislature. I think that's paid dividends for our voters. That's great. And and Matt, uh, you know, I know there's been um, uh, no shortage of of election legislation in Colorado in recent years, but but has your experience been similar? And again, uh, if you want to share perspective from sort of both sides of the, of the role, that'd be great. Sure. I think, you know, when we talk about, um, as I mentioned before, getting started in 2000 and at the state level, and, you know, when I got into it, I, you know, I never knew elections would be a career field, but I wanted to get into broader policy and politics. But one of the things that struck me from the very beginning um, about the clerks in Colorado, uh, much like Aaron is saying, our colleagues in Ohio are the same way. It was a bipartisan or nonpartisan approach when they came together at the association. It's foundational um, to what we do. And I think where we've seen successful associations across the country, you have people, men and women, who are able to come in and leave their politics at the door, um, realizing we're not going to agree on every issue. And so here in Colorado, there are some issues we know we'll never take up as an association um, because it's not worth it to even, you know, you know anything that might splinter um, unnecessarily. So um, there's still a broad, broad range of policies um, that are out there that we can come together on. Um, and as a clerk, um, you know, it's so funny, I'm a fairly conservative guy. Um, and my legislative co-chair at that time uh, was Hillary Hall from Boulder. She's a fairly progressive uh, person. Um, and yet, not only did we come together to work on important legislation uh, for elections, but we became phenomenal friends as well. Um, and I think that's something that's really special about the election community writ large is that it's men and women who come together can leave their politics at the door and focus on what, you know, providing safe and secure and accessible elections. And I think we realize that, you know, there's this there's this misconception out there that you can't have great access and you can't have secure elections at the same time. And I think where we're, we're successful is working together to say, yes, you can, and, and working on that. And we don't always agree in sight when we're having our legislative committees, 
But, you know, we have policies in place and procedures in place that we can come forward if we can come to an agreement. Um, and then we will advocate like heck to, uh, you know, at the legislature um, to make sure that, you know, that we can try to get to the outcomes that we want. Doesn't always mean we will. Um, you know, as Aaron said, sometimes you win some and you lose some. But it's important. It also helps. I think Aaron said this really well, too. You know, when you can have that bipartisan or nonpartisan approach, you build trust um, with legislators and they're far more likely to listen to you than if you just come in and you're looking to blow something up um, for political reasons, um, you know, for no rhyme or reason. So um, we've been very successful that way. Um, and it all starts at that nonpartisan posture that we all bring together. If, if I could maybe just jump in real quick, Commissioner. Uh, we, I mean, certainly agree with everything uh, Matt said. One of our kind of mottos um, that we try to live by as an association is if the legislature, you know, passes a bad election law, but we've told them it's a bad election law and they know that and they pass it anyway, well, shame on them. But if they pass a bad election law and we haven't even bothered to weigh in and share our thoughts, then shame on us. Mm -hmm. um, so we really do try to be proactive in working with our members of the legislature from both political parties to let them know hey, this is a great idea and here's how it's going to benefit voters or it's maybe not the best idea and here's how it would hurt voters. So maybe alternatively, you want to think about some other approaches. Um, we try to be constructive, always offer ideas rather than just come in and say no. Um, and I know Matt works very similar with his his legislature um, in, in that regard. Yeah, I think, and too, Ben, if I can, uh, Commissioner, if I could just add one thing too. I th we also know that people may not agree with the direction. Some of our members may not agree with what the majority want to do. So it's really important that we give everybody space. If they disagree with the association, it's no harm, no foul. You can go and you can advocate for something that you believe in, even if it's in um, opposition to where the association is. And it's really important that people feel that they can you know, still maintain their identity as their local elected clerk and reporter, um, even if it means being in opposition uh, to the association. A great example of that, 1303, our bill in 2013 that moved us to you know, mail ballot delivery. Um, I was I was one of four clerks uh, who came out against that bill at the legislature, and yet that same year, they elected me to leadership in the association. So giving people space, but still having respect and a respect for dialogue um, is, is paramount to a successful association. And that's great. And, and you know, actually, Matt, something you hit on there, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the friendship that formed through the association, uh, you know, the community. When I look at the state associations and certainly, you know, have the privilege in this job of traveling around to a, a lot of those conferences and 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 seeing folks and you know I think uh, I think in this moment in particular but but having that community having um, you know having folks that that are having similar experiences to you uh, and that's that's the election community writ large but within within the state associations you know we see dynamics where uh, you know there may be there may be formal or informal uh, mentoring dynamics uh, you know continuing education of course. Uh, but can you talk about how, um, you know, and, and Matt, I'll let you start again here, uh, serving in this role and in, in a professional capacity uh, or having someone serve in the role has, has helped strengthen uh, your state association uh, and in turn provide better support for the local election officials. Uh, and, and maybe just, I mean, you've hit on a bunch, but, but what are some of the most notable benefits uh, that, that you've seen? I think and then we'll come to you, Aaron. Um. <laughs> sure. I think the, I think the mentoring is huge uh, for members, um, and not just while I do. Uh, you know, I work for the clerks that are you know here in Colorado. I still hear from a lot of staff being able to mentor, um, and a lot of times, especially with incoming. And here in Colorado, we just, as I mentioned earlier, um, we just had a lot of turnover with term limits and such with the election coming in. So I think we have close to twenty new clerks. Um, that are coming in and they're coming in and they don't really know these a few of them have come up through the ranks but we have some people who have never worked in an office before so now we're focused on new clerks training and being able to welcome these people in with open arms um, and we know that there are some people coming in with preconceived notions they've heard you know some of the garbage that's that's out there um, and so now it's it's really important to come in take your time and humanize each other right one of the big things our conferences our regional meetings where we get together we spend some time you know get to know somebody get together at the you know at the bar after the sessions are over 
it's a lot when you like with Hillary Hall, I, you know, I've used that as an example already. When she and I are get to get, we're able to get together and Pam was great at helping us and bring us together, got together for drinks. We start talking about each other's family. We didn't even talk about work. It's just getting to know people. And once you get to that level, then you, you build that trust, which is so important. And so having, having, you know, an executive director, my experience with Danetta and Pam, who could help with that relationship building help with that mentoring so that when it came into a legislative discussion where, you know, let's say Hillary and I were on opposite sides, it wasn't coming from a standpoint like we see typically in today's politics where you demonize the person um, as well as their idea. Now it's, you know, okay, I, I have trust for her. So I don't think that she's coming in trying to steal elections or to advocate for something that I, that I don't believe in. You listen more and you learn more. And I think that's something that's been really important in our association and building those bridges. Um, you know, I think, and especially after 2020 um, and where we had the Tina, the Tina Peters thing, having Republic, the, the clerks be able to look Republicans and Democrats come together because we've built up trust through the years. You know, we've worked together on legislation. We've worked together on, on other things. Um, that has been invaluable um, to helping to helping our members, not just collectively, but in their day jobs, knowing, and, and you said it before, I mean, it's tough when there's so much crazy going on, but you know, there's, and here in Colorado, there's 63 other people who know what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can call anybody, regardless of their party, we don't even think about that. Um, I'm going to call whoever, I'm going to call Molly in Boulder now. We can decompress about the day. How did you, how did you handle this situation? Share those things. Um, and after a, a couple of years, like we just went through, having that sense um, of togetherness, of connectivity, um, I think is probably the most important thing, at least for our association that we've seen in a long time, is just knowing there's other people in this fight with you and we're all together. We're all right behind you. That's great. And, and Aaron, I don't know if there's anything you want to add there that you've seen in Ohio, um, uh, you know, some of the benefits for your members. Yeah, I'll, I'll just point to two really cool programs that our association sponsors and works on that I think have had huge benefit. And the one ties right into what Matt was saying. Um, we've actually formalized a mentorship program with our Secretary of State's office that um, as they come, as the new uh, directors and the new board members come in and receive their training, we actually work with Secretary of State's office to identify a formal mentor for the new election officials. Um, and there's some continuing education um, credits that are involved so that you know it's we kind of make it worth your time. Um, but that person knows that, the new person knows that they have at least one person that they can pick up the phone and call at any time, that they can get together with coffee with, that they can have a drink with, that they can look forward to seeing at our conferences, that's really got their back. Um, and we, we try to obviously make those uh, connections as similar as possible um, so that there's there's some rapport that kind of starts off immediately, but that's been a huge boon because as we all know, um, attrition and turnover right now is a huge problem in elections administration. Um, and so anything to strengthen that uh, and to let those new people know that they they do have friends and allies and people that are going to help them, I think is great. So I'm really proud of that. Um, the second program I'll mention that we're super proud of is our registered election official program. And that's our professional development and continuing education certification program. Uh, and we designed this um, actually in partnership with The Ohio State University. And so it's a great program uh, where election officials a couple times a year can take a three hour course, several three hour courses, uh, and they are co-taught between professors uh, or law professors um, at The Ohio State University. Uh, and then uh, they are they teach those in conjunction with local election officials. So half the class will focus on kind of the academic or legal aspect of various parts of the profession. Uh, and then the other half will be more practical and say, OK, now that you know the background and the law, let me tell you how it works in practice. Um, so it's become a great kind of partnership and uh, people rave about it. They're very entertaining. We get great, great people to teach those classes uh, and we basically sell out every time. Um, but again, as we, um, as Matt said from the outset, and I think you said, Commissioner, as we the, really the driving force has been to professionalize election administration, um, and that program is a key component of how we do that in Ohio. So proud of those two programs. That's great. Um, you know, that sounds really good programs and really good examples. And you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's some people watching this who are going to be like, yeah, this all sounds great, but you know, how do we pay for it? And so uh, I will, I will ask that question, Aaron. I don't know if you want to start us off, but you know, how does your association cover the cost of professional staff? Sure. So 
we when we started, and I'll be real candid, when I got hired on as the lobbyist back in 2001, the association actually redid their due structure and increased their dues pretty significantly to pay. Because uh, again, as Matt indicated prior to that, you know, there was really it was it was all kind of easy and and the admiss you know the the association kind of existed to have a conference and and have a place where people could go shopping and have a couple of drinks together and that was kind of it um but it became a lot more intense after that uh, and so gratefully you know our association did kind of redo its due structure a little bit um and then over the years as we've added these programs obviously we found ways to make some money and generate some revenue to help to continue to reinvest in the association and grow these programs and grow the opportunities for um, election administration here in the state. So it kind of, we found that success kind of begets success. You have to make that initial investment, but then as you do, you find that opportunities abound to continue to grow your association and, and the kinds of uh, things that your association can do for you. So for what it's worth, I mean, I, I would highly recommend making that initial investment if you're thinking about it, and you'll find that it just gets easier to do and more self-sustaining and better and better year after year. Well, clearly, if there was any angst about it in the beginning, they kept you around. So uh, it must have been must have been worth it. Uh, Matt, what about in Colorado? Very similar. I think uh, when that conversation happened to hire an ED back in 10 or 11, um, the dues uh, were increased um, to be able to do that. So we've worked that into our bylaws um, every two or three years where, you know, there's uh, we're going to have a due increase to be able um, to a dues increase to be able to do that. Very, very much the same. You know, we have a graduating scale based on pop county population for how much, you know, in dues that they have to pay. Um, but, you know, the members, again, very like Aaron said, you know, it's the success of the organization. And, you know, our members see um, that the juice is worth the squeeze with it. And so they're they're willing to help fund it. Um, it you know, and if something comes up, um, you know, where it's not really in our budget, we have to be careful. You know, I can, you know, Chuck Brewerman, who's the, our great clerk down in El Paso County, I can say, hey, Chuck, we want to do something with comms. You know, can do you have any money in your budget to help the association? And he's 100 percent. Let's do it. You know, I did the same in Arapaho. Um, so it's because people see the value um, that they're willing to help, even if it means taking out of their uh, budget for one off projects um, that come up. But again, it's all it's all because everybody sees um, and feels the tangible positive impacts of what the association has to offer. And, and I would add one thing. When we first started, you know, we're funded at the local level by our board of county commissioners, which is the legislative authority in each county. Um, and surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, um, I have a great relationship with my counterparts over at the county commission association. And they have always said consistently, look, if any of our members are giving your members a hard time over increasing membership dues or whatever it might be, you let us know and we will go to our people and tell them to knock it off because we partner on so many things that it really benefits them to have a strong election official association. Um, and so even our funders see the value. And so um, not that it happens frequently, but you know, we, we've never had any issues collecting dues because we have really great partnership with our uh, counterparts there at the County Commission Association. That's great and great to hear. And, you know, again, I think I think for folks who are looking at this, uh, you know, it's it, it's nice to hear uh, that that folks have, you know, found this to be a good investment. And and particularly uh, that's even, uh, you know, even other officials like seeing uh, a strong clerks or strong local election official association. And so uh, I guess, may, I, may I add one thing real quick? Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah I'm sorry. absolutely. One thing I forgot to mention, along with the dues, um, our conferences, we have two uh, annual conferences. And so we have trade shows as a part of our conference. So we invite, you know, our election technology providers, a recording motor vehicle to come in and to, um, you know, to show their new, their new latest and greatest. Um, and so that, uh, that drives in, it brings in some money for associations as well, uh, for, for our association as well. So between the dues and our conferences, those are the big drivers for us. Great. Uh, and so I guess just to kind of close things out here, uh, if somebody is watching this from another state and, and they've been thinking about making this transition or they are after this uh, excellent video, uh, <laughs> what advice or recommendations would you give them, Aaron, if you want to kick us off there? Yeah, I'll, maybe a couple ideas. Certainly Matt and myself and Catherine would be more than happy uh, to talk to any state that's looking at this. In fact, I, I have, I'm sure Matt has as well, and Catherine has, um, you know, the Democracy Fund has done a great job of kind of helping to galvanize this movement. 
um, and provided resources to states that are looking to do this. And so we've kind of created a little network amongst ourselves already. Um, tap into that network. Don't feel like you're on your own and you have to create everything from scratch. You know, I can tell you what works well, and I can also tell you what doesn't work well because um, we've learned from experience. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. We would be delighted to talk to you um, and, and to help you get started. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and Matt, anything you want to add? Oh, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I th and I think if you're um, and we've talked about some of the, the common themes today, right? I mean, you have to take a look at how you're going to um, finance and fund an association. I think the other thing too, uh, you know, getting off the ground is really making sure that when you're doing this, that people understand that, you know, politics have to stay at the door, that the, the way associations are successful, as Aaron and I said earlier, it has to be that bipartisan or nonpartisan approach to this. Um, it's the only way uh, to be successful. And if you want to have credibility, whether it's at the legislature or quite frankly, with other members um, of the organization or other state associations, you have to you have to have a common voice, a collective voice to do that. And the only way to do that is to come together, understand that um, for the association, it's the um, the whole, um, you know, you, you need everybody strong as a whole. You can't have people, um, you know, who are undermining that while still allowing people to have their space to have their opinions, right? So I, I think that's important. I think what we also see now, which is really exciting um, on a, and a great time to start a, st a state association, we're starting, Aaron mentioned the Democracy Fund. Commissioner, I know you all are working on this too. Um, it's bringing associations from states together and creating kind of more connectivity between state associations with each other. Um, where we can share best practices, ideas, you know, about how to move things forward. And so it's a really exciting time, I think, if you're if you're out there and you're interested in starting an association, um, we're here to help, as Aaron said, but also the information sharing that um, that it can facilitate across states as well as within your state. Um, it's it's really to your advantage. So it's an and it's an exciting time, a good time to take a good look at it. Well, Matt, Aaron, thank you uh, for joining this great conversation. Uh, and and we'll now turn to Catherine Harper from Missouri to discuss how implementing a similar role has worked in the Show Me State. All right, I'm now joined by Catherine Harper from Missouri. Uh, Catherine serves as the Executive Director of the Missouri Association of County Clerks and Election Authorities, a position newly created in 2022. Catherine is a former County Clerk and Election Authority and formerly served on the EAC's Board of Advisors. Thank you for that service. Uh, Catherine is also a former CPA and auditor with certifications in compliance, operations, and executive coaching. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm excited that you're here to join us. We're going to be continuing the conversation on professional staff for state, as for state associations that I uh, started with Matt Crane of Colorado and Aaron Ackerman of Ohio, who I I know you're familiar with both of them, and uh, I'll generally be asking uh, a lot of the same questions and look forward to just hearing about how things have worked so far in Missouri. Uh, and so to, to kick things off, if Catherine, if you could tell us a little bit more about how election administration is structured in Missouri. I know it's a, a, it's a little different some places, uh, and, and who runs elections at the local level, and if they have any other responsibilities. Well, thank you so much, Commissioner. First, I really want to thank the EAC and you for putting this uh, video together. I think it's uh, very important for state associations, and I hope Missouri can help uh, guide others. So thank you. For election administration in Missouri, it's run mostly by county clerks. So in Missouri, there's 114 counties, and the county clerk who is elected also serves as the election authority. In the larger urban areas, we have six election boards, and in those counties and two cities, there are uh, two board members, a bipartisan board that's put together, um, one Democratic and one Republican, and those are appointed by their, their own board at election and they run a little differently because they aren't elected, they're appointed, but for the majority of the state, it's, a, it's an elected position. Great. And uh, for the clerks, uh, for the elected clerks around the state, uh, what other responsibilities do they have in addition to in addition to elections? Well, other than one county, all the other county clerks are also the chief budget officer, 
um, and usually kind of like the chief operations officer. So they are heavily involved in county administration, including human resources, payroll, um, budget finance, and it's 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 a, a big job all on its own. And they're also the election authority. Uh, well, I like how. Uh, you know, uh, I say a lot about elections, particularly when we're doing 50 state work, it depends. And so, uh, again, we have a, a good example of that. Um, so moving to, uh, I mean, having you come on as as professional staff, as the executive director uh, for the state association is, is a new development. Uh, can you share a little bit about uh, why uh, the state association decided to, to professionalize this role? Well, absolutely. In Missouri, uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been done by other county clerks and election directors as a volunteer on a volunteer basis. And it's really hard when you are already doing what could be two or three jobs to then also volunteer. They found that it just they weren't as effect effective. And it's something they've been discussing for a while. Uh, Colorado and Ohio have had the position for a few years. And Missouri's toyed with it. What changed was during the pandemic and when the election authorities found, when they went to the state legislature or they spoke with the state agencies, they didn't have as much of a voice and a seat at the table as they liked. And it really made them mobilize and get you know engaged. And I think they said, if we wanna move forward, we're gonna follow the role of these other two states, Colorado and Ohio, and we're gonna hire someone. So that's how the position was created. Great. Uh, well, I mentioned mentioned earlier uh, in your bio uh, that that you served as as a clerk, uh, and, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I guess, one how that influences how you approach the position now, uh, and then two, uh, if you wish that the position would have been there when you were in the, your former role as a clerk. Well, first of all, I absolutely wish this position was there when I was a clerk. Um, I, I was appointed in, so my predecessor uh, resigned, and so I was appointed by the governor. And coming in midterm, it was very isolating and difficult to figure out um, what are the rules, what are the responsibilities, and how should I navigate this field, this new office. I was able to connect with some um, area clerks, you know, some regional clerks, but I Without that executive director, it was really hard to figure out what was going on across the state. So I would have loved to have had this this uh, this position. And I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. What was that again? <laughs> uh, it, was just, it was just how serving in that role has helped, uh, you know, sort of inform and shape how you approach the job now. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I think that is key. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons why um, the Missouri Association of County Clerks hired me because I do have that experience. Um, so just having an understanding in Missouri of all the different responsibilities that a, that a clerk goes through, plus having the election experience, I can connect quickly with our members. I can connect with the new people coming in and help guide them. So it's there's just a sense of uh, you know be, having an understanding, being able to connect and be empathetic when things come up. I mean, I know how difficult it is. I know what it feels like to have all this to get done and run elections and find poll workers and, and, and. And so having someone that's on your side, I think has really helped me connect. And likewise, they've been able to open up and reach out and say, I've got a problem. I don't feel like I can talk to um, maybe someone at the state agency, man. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, maybe I don't feel like reaching out to my neighbor clerk because, you know, I kind of, I'm, they're my peer and I don't want them to think less of me, but they felt really comfortable talking to me because I'd been there before. So that connection has been, been really great for us. That's great. Yeah. In, in talking to, to Matt and Aaron uh, earlier, uh, you know, there was a lot about just that sense of community and, and bringing the state association together, uh, you know, or bringing uh, officials together within that association and making it stronger, uh, you know, supporting one another through things like mentor relationships or just just even at the conferences uh, and sharing information. Um, uh, so that's good to hear as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about just sort of along those lines, um, you know, and again, uh, recognizing that 
uh, that it's that it's fairly a new role, but uh, how how some of your efforts to date, how you can see that paying dividends, um, how uh, it's helped strengthen the state association, uh, or or in turn to to better support uh, the local election officials in Missouri. So it's really helped strengthen our association by me being able to facilitate this network of volunteers, right? So we have a lot of clerks in Missouri. You know, we've got a lot of political subdivisions, um, and then on top of that, election directors and their staff, and a lot of them are involved in our association. So that's that's a force, and to have someone who it's me, like myself, to be able to facilitate, navigate that and utilize that has been very impactful. One of the things we did this year that was new is we wanted to have a stronger presence at the Capitol. So we started we started a, a legislative days where we go down together as a whole association, but then we follow up each week with a different region, with different clerks. Um, having them orchestrating that and then working with our different committees as far as training and mentoring. This year in 2023, we have one of the largest classes of new clerks coming in. We've got 34 new clerks. So out of 114, you know, that's about 30% that are coming in new. And four years ago, we had almost that big of a number again. So we've got a lot of new people. So working with our training and mentoring committee and helping them get lined up. The other thing that has been really impactful is I've been able to submit and gather data or get data from from everyone. So in Missouri, one of the rumors we heard coming up next year is a possibility of a senator submitting legislation that would remove all electronic voting tabulation machines and everything would be hand counted. County clerks, uh, everyone I've talked to, and I have I'll have 100% action answer, but county clerks were against it, right? They they. They feel like uh, the process we use is safe and secure in Missouri, and there's a lot of testing, and, and they feel comfortable with it. So we've been gathering data of what a hand count would look like by going back and going through our verification process, our post-testing process, to help our legislation under legislators understand just how long that would take, let alone the accuracy issues. Um, so being able to coordinate that data collection has been extremely important. And I think that's going to bring us some big dividends in the future. Absolutely. And and as we talked about uh, earlier with, with Matt and Aaron, just the importance of, um, you know, being able to provide that technical expertise and experience, uh, you know, from from people who, you know, know what it takes to, to run elections, uh, again, to avoid unintended consequences or or really to give that full picture of what the impact of legislation would be. Um, uh, so that sounds like, uh, again, having that that data-driven approach is, is a step in the right direction. And, uh, you know, I know there was, there was legislation uh, passed in the last cycle, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, I remember from when I was at the Missouri Secretary of State's office years ago, uh, you know, there was a need for for cleanup legislation uh, in the Missouri uh, code, and and that had stalled for a number of years. So, so clearly something, <laughs> clearly there's something different in the equation, and and I hope that is, uh, you know, that success continues for for the local officials there in Missouri. Um, uh, you know, one of the the questions that I asked uh, of Aaron and Matt, which uh, I feel like is is one of the ones for people watching this that they certainly are are curious about is uh, you know if they're they're listening to this and thinking yeah that might be good for my state but again uh, you know how how the association covers the cost of professional staff obviously that's that's a big part of the equation or, or making a move to this um, would love to hear that about Missouri and again to the degree uh, that you know obviously since it's recent um, sort of the decision making process in that. That's a great question. Um, so we also, I want to state, we do have a professional lobbyist that we uh, also utilize. So it's an executive director and a lobbyist that our state uh, election authorities are paying for. We voted this last year to um, increase dues. So that's been the biggest driver of what that cost is. And that 
Dues calculation is a sliding scale. So the larger jurisdictions are paying a higher amount than the smaller ones. Um, we also put on an annual conference and we do make revenue, have revenue from that. And so that helps offset some of the costs. The cost of the lobbyists specifically comes from the conference registration fees. We're looking for some other avenues in the future to increase revenue. Um, we're considering, you know, grants and some different ways that we can bring more, um, access more things in our state. Missouri has some laws against um, as some as the other states about receiving nonprofit money at the state election authority level. So we're also really careful that we are respectful of what our citizens wish, right? So Missouri County clerks do elections, but they also do tax administration, budgets, finance. And so there's some other avenues that we can utilize too. Excellent. And so, I mean, sort of along those lines, again, for, for people who've been watching this video, uh, you know, you, you've gone through this transition recently. Uh, and so if folks are, are thinking about this or watching this video and thinking about it, uh, do you have advice that you would give them uh, for starting up a, a, similar, um, a similar position or, or program in their state? So I would say you can dip your toe into it. You don't have to go out and get a, a full-time, high-powered, high-paid executive director from the day from day one. You can start with a contract basis, which is what I'm on. Um, and your there's other ways that you can do a little bit of it to help with whatever piece it, you need. And from that, I think it'll continue to grow that you can have a stronger association and a larger role. But if it's something that your members are interested in, you know, find a way to try it, see how you can get started. And I know I would love to help any other state or give advice, and I'm sure Matt and Aaron would also. Yeah, they definitely volunteered that. So, so if you're watching this video and you're interested in uh, exploring uh, a professional staff for your state association, you've got you've got three volunteers uh, in Captain Harper, Aaron Ackerman, and Matt Crane. Uh, and certainly at the AC, uh, we're always looking to help in any way we can. So uh, if if after watching this video you're looking for more information, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.